you know, maybe the guy who's a microbrewer says, okay, yeah, I, I, I'm thinking that in, in a few years from now, I want to open up a second one across town. All right, now we're going to have a different conversation about what you want to do. So I'm not treating everybody the same way, thinking everybody wants to be that business owner investor. Some people are just wanting to have that side hustle job and bring in a little bit of cash flow. Welcome to the J. Will CFO Show. I'm your host, Jeremy Wells. Thank you for uh, watching and listening in. Um, I'm really excited about our uh, guest this week. He's uh, going to bring something to the show that we haven't had yet and really bring a lot of knowledge that, that I haven't um, really been exposed to yet, but I heard him uh, in an interview on a podcast recently, and I thought this is a guy that uh, our listeners could definitely benefit from. Um, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce and welcome to the show Eric Bergmeier, uh, CPA, and also a certified uh, valuation analyst. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, he's going to tell us what that what that means and what that's about. Um, but first of all, uh, Eric, welcome to the show, and why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your business and how you help people. Well, thank you very, very much, Jeremy. I appreciate being invited as a guest here. It's an honor um, to, to uh, have folks even take the time to listen to me for 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it may be. Uh, I started my career in uh, public accounting way back in the early 90s. I was with, at the time, Coopers and Lyran, which eventually became PricewaterhouseCoopers. Spent five years in public accounting, did a lot of healthcare. Uh, did a lot of healthcare auditing, which eventually turned into healthcare consulting. Um, and then I went from working with PricewaterhouseCoopers to Cigna, and then from Cigna, I went to, uh, I ended up coming out to, of all places, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and became the CFO for the, one of the largest medical groups. So in my background, I've always had healthcare. Uh, about actually 10 years ago, I ended up buying uh, an accounting firm, which quite frankly could be a whole other podcast. I'm, going through that process. I was very lucky. The guy I bought it from was, was just a great gentleman and a great mentor, literally handed over the keys and said, hey, I'll stick around if you need me for anything, but it's yours. Go forward and do great things. And he was a great mentor and stayed in the background and helped on some complicated tax stuff. But over the last 10 years, I kind of got comfortable doing my own thing. And then we ultimately started building this firm that he had uh, into one that truly just serves the medical profession and more so uh, the dental community than uh, physicians. Uh, and we made that switch about five years ago. So we kind of went from buying a firm that was, um, you know, it was really friends of Dan. He, Dan was a big hunter. So everybody who we hunted with owned their own business. So we had truck drivers, we had construction guys, we had all kinds of different laborers, restaurants to, um, to one that now really serves principally dentists and doctors. And so over a 10-year period, we've, we've gone through this journey, kind of seen it all along the way. And it, what a great time in the last 10 years to be a private practice owner. Yeah. Um, so I'll end it with that. And then let's, let's keep going from there. What, yeah, what you, yeah. For sure. So, so um, you, that's interesting, especially the point about um, the, the, the hunting, right? The yeah. ha having those, those hobbies. That's a trend that I've, I've noticed a lot um, recently. So um, uh, John Garrett, I don't know if you've heard his, what's your and podcast yeah. and that, yeah. that um, uh, is, is a fantastic sort of uh, pulling back the curtain on yeah. these professionals that we see, as, we just see them at the office and what right. they're doing, but then realizing that, um, you know, they have lives outside of that and those hobbies and, and something even, more than that, um, you know, now being in this professional space is that those hobbies create a lot of the business opportunities that you end up working with, that you're not just, you're not just fishing with these people. You're not just hunting with these people. You're not just playing softball with these people, but you're developing these contacts that sort of become a, a an important part of your business. Yeah, for sure. And, and for Dan, that was a great thing because like, you know, I'm not a hunter. I grew up in New York City. I've got nothing against it, but you know, <laughs> Of hunting in New York City, right? right. When right. you're a hunter, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, you're out all day with people and you're doing all that stuff. And I'm a long distance runner. So unfortunately, my kind of my my thing <laughs> is a, a lot of a long time. <laughs> and so not right. a lot of runners in my in my group of clients, unfortunately. <laughs> right, 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 right. Although, you know, I, I gotta say when I was in grad school back in Baton Rouge, running was becoming a big thing in that uh community. And um, you know, it was that that um 
that bit of accountability of having those running groups where it was, um, you know, it would, it would be 30 minutes till time to meet up for that running yeah. group that night. Yeah. And I would just be sitting there after a long day saying, I don't know if I want to go. And then all of a sudden I'd get three or four texts from different people saying, Hey, you're going to be out here tonight. Right. And it yeah. just kind of yeah. forced yeah. me to get out there. Yeah. 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 That, that would be the one thing I would probably like to eventually join a running club for that purpose. Right, right. No, good deal. Good deal. I mean, for deal. me, so, the, the running all about thinking. I think a lot on those runs. So it's kind of a nice time to be alone, if you will. So Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I'm a similar way. I listen to a lot of podcasts. So, so getting out for those three or four mile jogs, that means I can knock out two or three episodes pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah, yeah, sure. Good deal. So, so yeah, back to your practice. So, so you found this niche in, in dentists, um, you know, even more specific than, than the healthcare industry. What led you down that path and, and where are you take, where are you going on that path? Yeah. So, so the odd thing was within the practice I bought, as it was a smattering of a lot of things, we happened to have a handful of dentists in there. And since my background was, was always healthcare, um, you know, I gravitated more to those clients off the bat um, and started kind of learning more about what they were all about and trying to see where I could be more than just a year-end tax guy, right? And, and, the, and the, I think the thing that most folks that are in the tax uh, side of the business hate more than anything else is that surprise phone call with the client, geez, you owe Twenty-seven thousand dollars, or something like that, and 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 of course, there's dead silence on the other side of the phone usually. So it's like, what what could we have done? To it, it may just be that it was what it was because you have a great business, but what will you do to kind of manage those expectations? And what I wanted to, what I started doing was asking these guys, guys and gals, if I could start doing their accounting more frequently as opposed to just at the end of the year and just and then becoming more proactive and that started about eight years ago when 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 this when this started changing because i hated those phone calls they hated those phone calls so how do we avoid those start being proactive right and so that's what we started doing and then once you started doing more of the accounting for these folks you're starting to learn a little bit more about who they are and how they run a business. And I, I gravitated to that. And I think if I could advise anybody who wants to get in a niche, um, you have look at all your clients and figure out which ones you like more than others and figure out maybe which, which clients you have more of in a given industry than others. I could have gone into to the restaurant side of it. You know, we had them, but we, we, we genuinely enjoyed working with dentists. And once you start building that relationship, not only with the dentists, but with the dentist suppliers and maybe some of the attorneys that work with dentists, then you start building this, what I call that ecosystem, where your name becomes common, not just with the actual client, but referring sources. And then we started building a, a business around serving dentists. And about five years ago, my wife, who's also a CPA and a partner in this firm, Cheryl, said, you know, we should go all in dental. And I'm like, all right. Why don't we do that? And, and then we did. And I have no regrets at all because we can be really great advisors to dentists more than any other industry. Very cool. Very cool. I, you know, I'm, I'm, Still young in this field, but but I'm trying to do the same thing with realtors. And so for the last for the last six months or so, I have been doing anything and everything I can to meet as many mortgage brokers and title agents and inspectors and yeah. uh, appraisers, you know, as well as the the realtors themselves. And and what you can do, what I found to really become truly beneficial was start doing speaking engagements. And I, I ended up connecting with a great. Um, well, it's a national, it's a, actually, it's a worldwide firm. Patterson Dental serves almost, I think, 40 to 50% of the, of the dentists in my market and across the country as well. I started doing presentations with Patterson on an annual basis. They had this thing called Day of Experts where they invited all their dentists and they talk about, we, we'd, we'd have a, a few hour conversation on a, on a series of subjects and they always wanted me to talk about section 179, you know, the exciting parts of section 179. And so maybe for your group, you, you, find, the, you find somebody who wants to host the similar client prospects that you want. And then you kind of go in and do a joint conference. And if you do those more than once a year, then you become the local expert. You're the go-to guy. 
that's, that really that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, that, that, that's great well. because I, yeah, because I know, I know among realtors, right, the, um, the, the 1031 exchanges, the uh, IRS designation as a real estate professional and how that affects your rental uh, income and, and different aspects of your taxes, right? And so there are these things that um, even professionals within this field are still trying to figure out for themselves and, and you know, but that, but that have that bearing on the tax, uh, tax liability and that kind of thing. I mean, for you, more, probably more than anything else, if you're going to be in that market, that a whole opportunity zone credit can be huge. That's a, that's a new thing that's getting hot, right? Is, is how right. those are working. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. And, and for you to be able to be the go-to expert, really understand the mechanics of that. I mean, again, as well as a 1031 exchange, boy, you could do, you yeah. could do a four hour conversation. I don't recommend four hours. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> really what you want is like 30 minutes for so them to know how great you are at it and then leave right. them more. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and now I'm, now I'm taking my clients who are, who are realtors and mortgage people, you know, and trying to tell them, trying to encourage them, look, you, you, you obviously you're, you're telling me about these clients that you're working with and, and there seems to be a theme here, right? So can we develop that? Can we, can we create a niche on that? Can we, can we focus and hone in on that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, I think that's a, that's a mentality that kind of trickles down to everyone's benefit. The, the, the easier it gets to, to get into these fields, the more we have to find that, that special sort of, um, you know, that, that unique edge that we have against the, against everybody else around us, the competition. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Good deal. Good deal. Cause that, cause I'm, I'm in the middle of a, of a region that's having a really hot real estate market right now. And so I'm just seeing the sort of free for all, you know, every, everybody wants to be a realtor right now, you know, in, in this area. And, and it's kind of, okay. You know, and, and they're all, they're all, I, I'm, I'm talking to them and they're all saying, I just need, I just need one good listing. I just need, you know, one good contract to go through. And I'm saying, you know, okay, well, what are you doing to make sure that you're the one that gets that listing? What are you doing right. to make sure you're the one that gets that contract? And, and I, it, it, you know, then I get back to the office and I say, well, what am I doing to make sure that, I'm the accountant that that realtor wants, you know, and, and it's this constant mentality of just how do I differentiate myself? You know, it, it, it's an interesting, uh, interesting comment because I, I think as tax professionals, which we, we are, uh, we take it for granted that everybody understands the obvious, what's deductible, you know, but, but for, these, for these folks that are maybe just becoming real estate agents, they have no idea about a home office expense. They have no idea about why keeping a log for your mileage is important. They don't know about the other expenses that they're incurring that may be deductible. And it's like, it, 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 we need to keep reminding ourselves that although we've been doing this, I think I've been doing it a little bit longer than you, but for a lot of people, it's just their first month or their first year on, on, on the potential prospect side. So we can't forget that the fundamental information to be presented is still critical to everybody. So if you can be able to be like the go-to guy, let me tell you about the top 10 things you need to be thinking about as a real estate agent in terms of running your own business right. and what's right. deductible. And they're like, yeah, I got to go to Jeremy because he's got it. Right. But you're like, right. everybody should know this, but they don't. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. Not so Absolutely. No, they just don't. It's, they don't. I taught before I became an accountant. I taught I taught political science. I taught international politics for ten years, and every every semester I would have a new class, and I would have to remind myself that you know that I've, I've got now I've got five years, six years, seven years advantage from everybody else in this room, and I have to put myself back in that mindset right. of how it was to be. A, a sophomore in college sitting down and reading about this and hearing about this for the first time. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because every time you sit down with a new prospect, you have to do that same kind of process of, okay, I've got to go back to the, what it, what is, what is deductible where ordinary and necessary, what does ordinary and necessary mean? Well, it means, you know, and, and, and kind of start from scratch every time, but yeah. And then, and so I think, um, you know, back, back to something we were talking about earlier before the show is that, you know, it's really beyond just that making sure your taxes get filed on time every year into much more of being an educator, being an advisor, being a coach, being a consultant, being a lot of these things that are going to be very difficult, if not impossible to automate and just teach a computer to do that. Right. We still need people um, sitting right. down and having these big conversations. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
Good deal. Good deal. So, so um, you, you're doing a little bit more than just um, just the the tax and books, though. And what what really um, you know got my uh, attention here, listening to your interview, was talking about um, valuation and and this this designation that you have that CVA. Explain a little bit about what that is and and what interested you in that and how you started getting into that kind of work. Yeah, so the CVA is a certified valuation analyst, um, and there's a handful of nationally recognized uh, valuation credentials. CVA is probably one of the most uh, popular um, in, in, in terms of people having the credential. Uh, the AICPA also has their designation. Uh, it's called the ABV Accredited Business Valuator. Uh, and both, uh, up until very recently, in order to get your ABV, you had to be a CPA. And on the CVA side, um, it was a little bit more challenging to earn your CVA credentials if you weren't already a CPA. And so I was. So it wasn't an easier path. It was just a little bit less restrictive. I still had a very intense workload to get through. And then there's another one. It's called the ASA, Accredited Senior Appraiser. Those would be the three big granddaddies of valuation credentials out there. And, you know, it, many businesses are unfortunately valued by like just the guy on the corner who's selling a business, right? And there's business brokers out there and they do what's called rules of thumb. They say, you know, multiply your revenue times 70% and there you go. That's what the sales price is, not necessarily the value. Where valuators become much more critical, obviously and unfortunately at times of like marital dispute or partnership dispute, many times, uh, well, the courts are going to want in a, in, a, in, a, in a marital dispute, especially if it has to go to trial, somebody who's credentialed that has that level of experience to, to explain to the judge and to the jury how you scientifically value a business. And it's not just, well, 70% of sales, there you go, it's done, right? And then of course, if you do anything that from a, as you may know from a, a, an IRS perspective, if you're doing valuations for estate planning, so, so in those issue, in those instances where a valuation has to be attached to a return and they are desk reviewed by the IRS, you do need this level of certification in order to do those. Uh, I picked up this, the valuation credentials mostly because as I started building this, um, uh, you know, the ecosystem, I ended up getting a lot of new clients from bankers once they, once the bank financed a, a dentist buying a practice, they're like, okay, now um, and if, if in your market, uh, you don't have a CPA, we would recommend Eric Bergmeier because we know he serves the dental community. And then I, as, as I was looking at these valuations and, 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 and taking these kids on, uh, realizing that they overpaid for their for their for their um, practice, and mm -hmm. and what I wanted to do is is try and get in front of these folks ahead of buying their practice, and I wanted to become more again advisory and consultative ahead. And and quite frankly, the the NACFA has some great programming and great marketing. And one day I happened to get across my desk, uh, an upcoming valuation conference and it was in Vegas in December. And I'm like, this is the perfect time for me to do this. So I did. Uh, and it was a two year journey to earn the credentials, but I, I do now feel that I have much more confidence in advising uh, a, a dentist on the due diligence process. Hey, there may be a, a purchase price being offered or a selling price, but let me tell you whether or not that is a fair price for the cash flows you're acquiring. So that's how we go through that process now. So again, from my perspective, not only serving dentists as an accountant and a, um, a tax advisor, now I'm going deeper into the industry, learning about the buy-sell. So when I have a 55-year-old doc in front of me and I can ask him, hey, when are you looking to sell? And what are you expecting to get out of this when we look at your overall retirement plan? And does the value you think you're going to get, is it warranted based on the business you have? And if not, I call it that valuation gap. How do we get you to where you want to be? And now that's where you can really become much more of an advisor to your clients today. We may not be selling the practice for 10 years, but now we've got a 10-year plan, him and I, about maximizing the potential value of your practice when you are ready to sell. And by the way, since we work with so many dentists, we may be able to help you sell it and find a buyer right away for you because that's what we do in this market. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so let, let me, let me just kind of, 
um, pull this back a little bit because, yeah. um, you know, I, I, most of my clients, they're not there yet. Right. They're, they're, they're just getting started, like maybe within okay. the last couple of years. Right. And so, um, the idea here is that you're going into an industry where some people have been operating for a long time already and, and they're looking, they're looking to retire soon. They're looking for a way out. So whether it's a dental practice um, or another accounting firm or something like that. Right. And they're looking for a way out. And so they, they want to keep the, the, the business intact, but they just want to be able to get out of it. And so they, they basically want to pass that torch onto somebody else, but they want to get paid for it. (laughs) Right. And so, and so you help, you help them make sure that they're putting the right price on, on that, on that practice, on that business, on that office, whatever it is. Yep. Yes. Yes. And then, no, no, I, I, and, and so, and so, um, you know, I, as the, as, as the person coming into this field, right. You know, and, and I, and I see, okay, um, I, I kind of want to get a jump start. I don't want to have to, you know, build this thing from scratch. I'm going to take over, you know, one of these exist at, I've got, I've got some capital or I can get the financing. So, so I just want to buy this practice and start working from there. Um, so I'm going to go, I'm going to make an offer, but I want to make sure that, um, the price that is being asked and the offer that I'm going to make that, that this is based on, on some true reflection of the value. Not like you said, just some shortcut of he, he, here's some percentage of the revenues or here's what things look like on the balance sheet, but this is a fair price for, for what I'm about to buy. Yeah. So, so when you, when you, when you think about the value, the value process um, in, in our world on the valuation side, we, it's, the fancy term is the benefit stream. Um, you're selling a benefit stream. And th- that basically is the free unencumbered cash. And in that cash amount, there should be two components, a return to the owner uh, for compensation as a professional doing the work. So in a dentist, um, after I generate all this revenue and pay the pure operating expenses, I need a return to me for my labor right? I, I have to be paid a fair price because if I'm not, I might as well just be, be an employee of somebody else. Same thing on the accounting side. If I'm buying an accounting practice and now I'm only getting paid uh, $50,000 because it's the only free cash flow, well, I'm probably worth a heck of a lot more than $50,000, so I might stay put. So we have to put this, this concept in, the, in, you know, we have to brace that seller for what is he actually selling? The, the buyer has to have a return to the labor and then a return to the owner investor. And when you finance the acquisition, that extra component, that extra part of return should be the element that covers the debt service. So you, when we look at total revenue, operating expenses, what is left? two components. One component is to pay you a reasonable salary as a professional for all the work you do. And then the second is the remaining cash flow that should cover the debt service. Now, banks, and I I love my banking partners, a lot of times they're willing to extend that component of what gets covered for debt service at the expense of compensation to the doc. Because they know that the deal cash flows for them, but the doc may be going home with less. So we want to make sure that, and that's the education process. And that happens whether it's a dentist or an accountant buying a practice. This sounds like, um, to to me, this sounds similar to when, um, when a, when a mortgage officer at a bank will say, based on what I'm seeing, you can afford this much of a monthly payment for a mortgage. And, and you sit back and say, well, that'd be true if I didn't have to eat, right? If if I didn't have to pay any bills. Yes. My cash flow, you know, my, my income, for the, for the month, right. looks like it could afford that payment, but that's all it could afford. There's nothing left for me. That's right. That's right. And, 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 and why I become more important in this process, you know, on the due diligence side is I'm able to have that conversation with the prospective buyer and say, yeah, this deal may cash flow, but you may be eating peanut butter and jelly and ramen like you did back in medical school for the next five years at the sacrifice of adequate compensation. And the sell and the sellers using a broker at times, and, and there's good brokers, there's bad brokers out there. And these brokers are like, yeah, every practice sells for 70% of revenue. Well, that's not that's not appropriate. Why well, you know, you may sell at 70%, but you may have a practice that has is overly staffed, 
uh, has high other overhead, so that that benefit stream is really small. So th th those are the things we need to look at. Or, as well, you could be looking at a practice that has declining sales. So what it may be valued at today, if you just look today, is likely not what it's going to be valued at in another year if you're routinely losing patients because you're 65 and you haven't really focused on marketing, you know, and you don't have any new patients anymore and your entire patient population is already 75 to 80 years old, so they're dying. And, and now, you're, now your practice is dwindling and the kid coming along says, oh, well, you know, it's in a, it's in a great corner. Yeah, but every year you're losing 15% of your business, and so you got to start all over again. So I, one of the things I think you wanted to, to get me to say in this process was, you know, are you selling systems? Are you selling a viable business, or are you trying to offload a headache? And a lot of times when we go through this due diligence, we could say, this is a practice that's spot on. It's humming along. It's growing every year at 5% or 7% or 8%. For all of you accountants out there thinking about this when you're ready to sell, you want to be thinking about what, what does your practice look like when it's ready to sell. You're acquiring new clients, you're growing revenue, your profit margin is expanding or staying the same and it's very healthy as opposed to one where you are losing patients or losing clients and your staff hasn't turned over and you keep giving them raises every year and every year your profit margin compresses, compresses, compresses. So you're no longer selling a real business, you're trying to offload a headache. Those are questions you need to be thinking about when you're having these conversations again with your clients. Are you selling a business or are you trying to offload a headache? And we may look and, and, and we probably have clients right now that are like, we know they got headaches. You can't sell headaches. Can <laughs> it's harder to sell, right? Right, right. Yeah, and it you know the 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 last the last minute or two here it really really addressed what has been sort of the the lingering question that I've had in my head. You know, as far as thinking about the, this conversation and 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 you know having you here for this interview is, um, you know, back to thinking about. Uh, say I do start a business from scratch and I am, you know, ju just getting going and, and I know that this is what, you know, I want to do and I'm planning on, you know, giving this everything I've got for the next 15, 20 years. But then I want to be that, that old person who's, you know, getting ready to move out and I want to, I want to find a buyer for this business. What can I start doing, you know, from, from the very beginning, what can I be doing and what can I be, you know, keeping in the back of my mind as I'm building this business over the next, you know, one, three, five, ten years mm -hmm. to make sure that I wind up with something that, you know, a prospective buyer is going to look at and say, this isn't a headache. This is a good business. You know, mm -hmm. what, what can I be working on today to make sure that 10, 20 years from now, this is, this is a good sale. This is good on the market. Yeah. So um, I, 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 a couple of great books that people want to always be reading. Number one, uh, two great books I would recommend you everybody read. Um, and if you haven't, and probably most many people have already is the E-Myth by Michael Gerber. And it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a quick read and it summarizes to, you know, ultimately one or two points is either, either you're working in the business or you're working on the business and working on the business is building systems. And literally that means write everything down so that somebody else can repeat it. You can't do that in a week. You may not be able to do that in a year, but have the mindset that you're building systems, have a systems based business so that you can have others do some of the work. Now, when people start a business from scratch, they may be doing it because they just lost their job and they're like, this is the time I'm going to do it. And if you're starting from scratch, that's great, but you're going to ultimately figure out what you're best at in the business and then figure out from there what you are weak at and then hire people to surround you that are strong where you're weak. That's going to take some time. And you just, and that's a self-awareness thing. Um, but you need to start with building systems. Think, and the whole thing about the E-Myth book is, think about it from the perspective of a McDonald's. It's franchise-based, it's systems-based. The person that buys a McDonald's doesn't really want to go in and run the cash register or flip burgers. They're, they have capital and they're just trying to figure out where best to deploy it. And when they can, and they can buy a McDonald's, they're buying something that runs itself. Right. And so you th have to think about over the years as you build your business, are you are you getting to the point where it can run itself? 
And the big test of that is where I am today is, can I take a full summer off and the company doesn't blow up? <laughs> and, and right now, I can't do that. I can take three weeks off. I can take four weeks off. But I really can't take the full summer off. Until I can take a full year off, I got to be able to take a full summer off. That's the test. But you have to surround yourself with good people. You have to build a system. So that's the E-Myth book. The one other book I'd recommend people read, and it's kind of, it's very repetitive, but it's the cash flow quadrant from uh, um, Kiyosaki. I can't remember his first name. Um, but he's the rich dad, poor dad guy. Uh, I, 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 his, his first name will come to me, but if you've read the Rich Dad, Poor Dad series, and if you're in real estate, everybody's read all those books. Uh, and he's got the, the, the cash flow quadrant is you are, and, and this again becomes thinking about you as a, as, a, as a business owner, you are either employed and collect a W-2, you could be self-employed, which is fine, which is nice because you have control. You're your own boss. And then you can either, and then you can ultimately become a business owner, which means you have other people working with you making money. And then you can ultimately be an investor where your money is invested in companies and you're getting returns. And so the quadrant is how do we go from being employees, which is where you may be starting self-employed employee to one where you can ultimately begin to hire other people that can do the repetitive work and start adding to your bottom line without you having to do every single thing so that you can, I love the, you know, the kind of from a tax perspective, be an S corp, real S corp person where you're collecting wages and there's a profit. And the reason why there's a profit is other people working to make you money. Right. Right. That's a, that's a big thing that when, so a lot of clients are coming to me, the, the ones that are self-employed and, and you know, they're, they're at a, they're at that point in terms of, um, the kind of work they're doing and and the kind of net income that they're that they're getting to where an escort makes sense. And so the you know I jump right into that reasonable compensation discussion, right? You know I, I explain to them that the, the, this is the this is the cornerstone of the escort concept. This is what can make or break you as an S corporation. But then I try to explain to them you know sort of the the that it that it's the key concept, but it's also a very gray area, right? And, and there is no set definition. There is no set formula. We have to figure this out. And here are the things that are going to nudge it back and forth. And, and to me, this is a great segue into th this, is, this is how you see and define your role within the business, right? Because if you're doing things that make you less critical to the business, you're the owner, you're always going to be important to the business. But if you're doing things that on a day-to-day -day basis make you less critical, then guess what? We can save you even more taxes, right? You know, right. And that, that's sort of the way I kind of hit it home to them, you know, starting off early on. But, but I kind of I try to tie reasonable comp and building a business in this way that, that pushes the owner in this direction of thinking futuristically, thinking forward with the business. Right, right. Yeah, yeah and it's, so. It's those two concepts ahead. that I kind of talk about from the valuation perspective. It's a return to labor and a return to capital. And the capital in an S-corp, especially with the dentist, the, the capital is the human capital and there's equipment capital too. And it's okay to make money off of other folks working for you. And it's okay to expect, because you're supposed to get a return on your investment in capital. So we can get deep in the weeds on this one, get kind of wonky and say, you know, if you were all that additional income is still subject to self-employment taxes, which it shouldn't be because a return on your x-ray machine is not self-employment tax to you. <laughs> All right. right. So, so the right. concepts again, from a valuation perspective also apply to that S corp and also apply when you think longer term, you want to be paid and you need to be paid for the work you do, but you, and that should be subject to those payroll taxes and self-employment taxes. But the other component that operating profit should escape that because it's really return on the risk you took on hiring people and the risk you took in investing in equipment. So that shouldn't be subject to employment taxes. And that's where really I think the government says, okay, this is why the S corp yeah. should make sense. So let me, let me ask you this then, because, you know, we're in this, we're in this, um, this sort of era, I guess, you know, it, it seems like it at least of, independent contractors, right? More and more people are independent contractors. And so, you know, they're, they're not treated as employees. They are self-employed, whether they realize it or not. Um, and then also this, this new, um, you know, movement of, of influencers, right? You know, people, people jump on social media and they want to be an influencer, right? And so how do you, how do you explain, uh, uh, 
or, or, or how do you convince these, these individuals that, that truly are building businesses around themselves, right? That, yeah. that there is, you do need to be thinking about systems. You do need to be thinking about putting something into place that's beyond yourself when you're defining the business around yourself. You yeah, know, how, you know what I'm saying? Because, yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 and I, I don't know if this is that different from what we're already doing, right? Because, you know, a, a, dental, a dental practice or, or an accountant's office, well, it's named by the people that run the place, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and so it's obviously mm-hmm. about them, but mm-hmm. we're also very systems oriented, right? We think about the accounting system. We think about the tax prep system. And so, you know, how do we take, how do we take these influencers or these programmers and developers that, you know, right now it looks like it's just me, right? Like mm-hmm. I am the business. And how how do we get them thinking more in terms of systems and this kind of thing? Well, I, I think you might want to start with asking the question, where do you see yourself? I mean, it sounds like the cheese ball question when you're interviewing for a company, where do you see yourself in five to 10 years? You know, and that might just prompt the question where let's say, let's say you've got a side hustle as an Uber, Uber driver and, and, and he happens to be a client of yours and there's a W2 and then there's a schedule C with the Uber driver and he loves or she loves being an Uber driver. And, you know, she says, well, or he says, you know, I'm, I'm just going to keep doing this as my side hustle. It, you know, it helps pay for the kid's college and that's about it. You're like, well, okay, maybe, maybe I'm not going to invest this uh, heavy duty conversation around, you know, systems on somebody who's just wants a little bit of side action. Again, from the, from the cash flow quadrant, they're an employee or they're self-employed and that may be the only place they're ever going to be. Now there may be others that say, yeah, eventually I'll look to want to take this to, um, you know, maybe across state lines and, and, and consider bringing on people in another market. You know, maybe the guy who's a microbrewer says, okay, yeah, I, I, I'm thinking that in, in a few years from now, I want to open up a second one cross town. All right, now we're going to have a different conversation about what you want to do. So I'm not treating everybody the same way, thinking everybody wants to be that business owner investor. Some people are just wanting to have that side hustle job and bring in a little bit of cash flow. So I think it's a matter of just asking the question. And I think that's a great first question because we don't typically ask that. Your tax return is done. I saved you $5,000 in taxes by electing the S Corp and see you next year. <laughs> right? Right. So right. But what, 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 we, what can we do to start the further dialogue? And I think it's just a matter of what are, you, what are you looking for in the next five to 10 years? And I don't think a lot of times people are even asked that question by anybody else. You know, I, you know, I never thought about it. I, th- I think it's a great point. I think, um, I think the focus, you know, from that, from that tax perspective is so much, how can I save on taxes this year? Right. You yeah. know, how, how can I, how can I get through this year with as small tax bill as possible? And, and there is that, okay, let's get your, let's get your return filed, but then, you know, let's bring you back in for another conversation about, okay, this is beyond just tax savings. This is, like you said, where are you five years from now? Because we can just keep saving taxes for five years, but then you will have saved some in taxes for five years, but you don't really have anything else to show for it. Right. And And that's why I think trying to do the monthly accounting is really important because it keeps you top of mind with your client as opposed to you just coming in in December and we, you know, just quickly put together what you may look like and come up with an estimated tax payment to make. So the, the whole idea of really trying to serve your clients and build a better business than just tax prep is getting in front of them on a, if not every month, because a lot of people are like, well, and, and we sell monthly accounting service. That's what we do. But that doesn't mean we're sitting down with the client every single month. They're busy. We're busy. It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't need to happen that way. But on a quarterly basis, but come July, we've definitely should have had at least one deep, meaningful conversation about the year. And I'm trying really hard now to start asking those follow-up questions. What about the year after? What about the year after? And, and, and that's where you can start kind of getting an idea of what more they want out of their business. Got you. Got you. Well, that, that's, that's really helpful. It's really educational for me. I think it's educational for the listeners to, to yeah, because I, it, it's so easy to get caught up in. I've got to pay the bills today. You know, I've got to, I've, I've got to save on my taxes this year, but beyond that, I don't know, right. How I'll, I'll just, I'll figure it out then. And, yeah. and that, that, that tax time comes around quicker and quicker every year. Yeah. <laughs> you right. know, and, right. Yeah. yeah. 
Good deal. Good deal. So, um, so beyond the, beyond the books, beyond the e-myth, right. Um, you know, and, and really thinking about these systems and, and how to, uh, how to put those in place so that, yeah, you can start pulling yourself back, uh, from the day to day operations. And, and I do tell my clients, I do tell them, you know, I, I want you thinking less about working in the business, more about working on the business. Um, what, any other advice or recommendations for, for new business owners, people just getting started in their, in their business? So if you are a new business owner and you are in the accounting tax prep side, my recommendation more than anything else is to get some of your CPE, some of your continuing education rather, um, from um, you know, conferences. Okay. Sit with people that you yeah. don't know. And in, in some of these great national conferences, you can sit at a table with somebody from another state that well, you may never even driven through. And that's kind of less important other than the fact that you may have never met this person otherwise. And just learn from them, their experiences. You know, I, I know I can get literally all my continuing education online and I can cheap out and spend 900 bucks and get all my hours and just sit in front of a computer. But I spend money by going to these conferences and I go to more conferences than I need to uh, from a CE perspective to get more exposure to other people that are hopefully doing better than me and I can learn from them. And I, and I also like to kind of sit at the table and try and answer questions. Um, if you were otherwise not in the accounting industry and you are starting a business from scratch, I, 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 I try and find those one or two people that are already in the industry you're in that are killing it and, and try and get them to be your mentors. You, everybody needs mentors along the way. I still need to find a mentor. I've got a coach. I'd love to find a mentor right now. Um, and, and, and that may be the other thing is, is find a coach. And that could be you. You know, that could be your uh, tax prep person. That could be your accountant. If they're willing to be uh, engaged in that, in that type of relationship. Um, for, for us, one of, one of the biggest uh, mentors that I, I have had over the years, um, and, and it's really been because he's been so generous with his free stuff, is a guy named Mark Wickersham, who's really talked about how to price. And I've listened to a ton of his stuff. And, and we've, we've kind of built our pricing model around everything he espouses. And we've now added a fourth column to talk, to, to promote to clients that we now offer coaching and consulting. Um, really, if they didn't ever thought about getting it from anybody else, they can now reach out to us and say, I'm interested in this now. And this is why I need it. Perfect. But, but find a mentor, find a coach, try and talk to others that are already in the industry that are killing it. Just be a sponge and learn as much as you can. I know I got my start because of having a great mentor, um, you know, and, it, and it's definitely something that with my clients, I try to put, you know, I, it, that is one of the first conversations I have, you know, who, who's your mentor, right? Like how, what got you into this field and who, who showed you the ropes basically, yeah. you know, and, and, and are you still working with that person? Do you still connect with that person? If, if not, are you looking for a new one? <laughs> because, you know, and, and it's, it's really interesting because, you know, like you, you've obviously been in this field for a while and to still, sit back and say, I need a mentor, right? You know, that's not really something that goes away. You know, you can, you can be in a field for a long time. You can be really successful. You still need somebody that has just a little bit more of an edge on the field than you do to, to bounce those questions off of, to go to, to get that advice from. And then, you know, I, I, I know you, brought up um, accounting conferences and I, I know realtors have conferences and, and, you know, they have continuing education as well. And, you know, I'm sure dentists do too, right? I think, you know, most professions do. And so um, I'm the same way I came out of um, higher education where, uh, a, where uh, academic conferences were, were a key part of the job. You know, I was assigned classes to teach, but I was also expected to go promote um, my work and the work of the university at these conferences. So, so that was, that was ingrained in me as a, as a uh, important part of, of the profession. And mm -hmm. it's something that I definitely um, look forward to uh, in accounting as well as, is getting to these conferences and, you know, because it, it, we're constantly trying to find people to sell to, but at the yeah. same time, we need to spend a little bit of time with people that, that are in the similar position as we are to, to bounce those ideas off of, to find things out. And then, yes, absolutely. I, I'm a big fan of Mark Wickersham. I, I've been paying a lot of attention to his stuff for recently. And, 
it, it's interesting because it's, it's also made me think about, you know, my own practice, but then also my clients, right. And, and pushing them to think, um, you know, I, it, it, everybody wants to be a disruptor. Everybody wants to revolutionize their field. And, and to some extent, you know, a lot of these fields are still dealing with, uh, you know, half a century old best practices and these kinds yeah. of things. And so there is always, you know, there is some need for innovation, but um, I, I do, I do look at some of these fields like, um, like real estate. And, and I do kind of, has anybody questioned this idea of you get a 3% commission? You know, has anybody questioned that idea of that's the value you bring to it is 3% of whatever the selling price was, you know I mean? It, and, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying, you know, has anybody ever questioned it? Has, has anybody ever considered where that came from? And if we still want to be doing business this way, you know, and, and, and I think, I think, um, you know, when it, when it, it, you, I, I eat and my family eats based on the prices I charge my clients and, and them paying them, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, I have to think very carefully about how I price my services. And, and um, I, it, it's, it's interesting to go back to the clients and have a similar conversation with them. Um, yeah. There are things like uh, talking about reasonable compensation where, especially now under the tax cuts and jobs act where we have this differentiation between specified service businesses and, and all these other qualified businesses. And, and I've seen some, um, I've seen some writing on this where because we have these uh, automatically defined specified services such as accounts and lawyers, but then also consultants. And yeah. so I get some clients that, um, you know, they want to be marketing consultants. They want to be social media consultants. And, I'll, and I have to be cautious with them. I have to stop them and I say, okay, but explain to me what a relationship with a client looks like. Explain to me what service you're providing. Explain to me um, the deliverable to the client. Mm -hmm. Explain to me how you're invoicing these things mm -hmm. because I don't want you to be a service, a specified service business if I can help it, right? Mm -hmm. If you really are doing consulting, but if you're actually coming up with some tangible deliverable, then maybe you don't have to be a specified service industry. Um, and, 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 I, and so even, even the, the way you're labeling things and pricing them on the invoice, I think, you know, I'm trying to see if that has some sort of, you know, impact on things like your tax liability. Yeah. You know, and, and so, yeah, I, th I think we have to be really careful about things like pricing um, right, and, right. and where we're coming up with that. And, and whether or not it came from Mark or my coach, you know, it's, you know for the accountants that are listening, um, as you learn how to improve your business, that's great because it improves your business, but it's also greater because it may be an advisory opportunity for a client. So think about what you do to make your business better and then turn around and be like, how can I sell this to my clients? Right? So there's, so there's, there's always a second thing you should be thinking about. How do I improve my business? And then as a consultant and we're screwed with the SSTB. Yeah. There's no way around it for us. But we're stuck. Um, but how do I, now can I turn it around and then offer that as a consulting service for my clients? If I'm, if I'm, doing something different in how I'm pricing and billing, can I talk to my clients about how they are pricing and billing? And, and unfortunately for my dentist, there isn't much I can do, but there are some things we can have conversations around. Sure, um, sure. Yeah. But, 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 but nonetheless, you can have those conversations and should, and, and regardless of what the industry is you're serving, there probably are things that you're doing to make your business better that you can now say, oh, I can offer this as a service to become a consultant, to become an advisor beyond just tax prep and accounting to really deepen that relationship with the client. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that, that sounds good to me. Um, I think, uh, I think on that note, uh, we're going to, we're going to wrap this up. We're running a little bit long on time. I, I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate you being here. Um, you know, we get a, get a few more episodes down the road, might have to bring you back on some of these topics that we, we've talked about that we could, like you said, go on for, for other episodes about ep other episodes in themselves. There's always more topics that, um, you know, more, more questions get raised <laughs> than, sure. than answered in these kinds of conversations conversations. And I love that, you know, I'm a very yeah. um, questions oriented person, you know, like I yeah. said, I, I taught for a long time and, and something that I always told my students there, there are no, there's no right answer, right. But there are right questions. You know, mm -hmm. you gotta be asking the right question. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's been a pleasure having you. Thank you so much, Eric, for coming on here. If um, people are interested and they want to learn more from you, um, how can they, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? 
Oh, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. My last name's Berg Meyer. I'm, I'm, I've, I've got a lot of connections already. So may, hopefully your listeners are maybe connected to me already and please do. But my email address is Eric at my And, and I will share with you that as I've, I've done other podcasts like this, some folks have reached out to me because they've had valuation questions. They've had clients approach them and uh, I, I have been able to assist those accountants, those enrolled agents on some of the complications that may come up in the valuation process. So it, it, it does happen quite a bit that uh, people are reaching out because they do have uh, some valuation issues more than anything else. So good deal. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, um, you know, it, like, like, like I said that, that, you know, save me money on taxes, get me more cash flow this year, but um, you know, let's, let's start thinking about what you're going to have 20 years down the road. Right. Sure. When, when you're ready to pull out of this. So yeah, I, I definitely a question I want to start uh, bringing up with my clients more. Definitely a question that um, I think a lot of business owners need to need to start asking themselves, whether you're just getting started, or you've been doing it for a while, you know, think about what you're actually building, what you're actually creating and, and what's it worth, you know? And yeah. Yeah. And, and, and to end on this kind of interesting statistic, I, I think when you, whoever shares it, it's something similar to every day, 10,000 baby boomers are retiring. And I right. think that's going to be happening for years on out. So if you, that means more than likely those of us that are on this podcast that are accountants, enrolled agents, bookkeepers, tax prep people, um, likely have a bunch of business owners that are approaching retirement. You just can't avoid it at this point. You should really be having that conversation with them now. What's your business worth? What's your exit plan? Do you expect something out of it? And they may be thinking, I never really even thought about it. I thought I'd just close the shop when I turned 65 and, and started collecting social security. Well, you may be able to, to monetize something. And we have time to do that. So they should really be thinking about that now because there are so many baby boomers that are, are that are of that age. So something to think about. That's incredible. There, it, it's a it's a it's a really interesting time to be to be sure. you know young and getting started. Um, you know, there, there's a ton of opportunity out there that millennials are getting a fairly hard time right now. But I think you know I think there's a ton of opportunity out there to to you know you just gotta you just gotta find your find what you want to do, find your niche, and and just start talking to people and figure out your way to get into it. Abundance mentality, brother. It's it just <laughs> it's out there for you. Just, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Good deal. Well, again, Eric, thank you so much. Really appreciate you being on here. And um, I want to thank all the listeners. And uh, show notes and description uh, will be available. Um, and uh, we'll have contact information for Eric, uh, how you can uh, get in touch with him. And uh, also want to remind everybody: follow uh, Jwell CFO on social media. Subscribe uh, if you're in uh, YouTube. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all the, all the social media as well. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you again, Eric. Thank you, Jeremy. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.